Rasputin today is considered not just an historical personality, but an urban myth. The Russian mystic and self-proclaimed holy man Grigory Rasputin's life makes truth appear stranger than the fiction that was woven around him. His cruel and strange antics, his love for women and theatrics, and his sheer will to not perish have earned him a place in the Hall of Infamy for real-life monsters like Vlad the Impaler, Attila the Hun, and Viking Berserkers. Welcome to Nutty History, and here are some creepy facts about the lover of the Russian queen, the undying Grigory Ra Ra Rasputin. Viewer discretion is advised for this video, as some of this video may be offensive or disturbing. We, the makers of this video, in no way support or condone the actions of the subjects featured. The year was 1905, and the failure of state-level leadership, uncontrolled inflation, the rise of poverty, and the general resentment due to the Russo-Japanese War caused unrest in the motherland. The general strikes were soon followed by masses revolting against the Tsarist monarchy from St. Petersburg to Poland. However, Tsar Nicholas II managed to save his throne and crush the revolt at the cost of transforming the Russian government from an autocracy into a constitutional monarchy. But the foundation of the Romanov's family reign over the Russian Empire was definitely shaken. The Tsar's family was vulnerable, and there could not have been better timing for Rasputin for an introduction with the Serena. Rasputin had garnered a reputation in the last eight years traveling all over Russia, performing so-called miracles, seducing women, and proclaiming to be a holy man. Serena Alexandra was surely aware of Rasputin's ill reputation, and yet she was probably intrigued or desperate, or maybe a bit of both, to let this man enter her household. Over the years, Rasputin tended to her sick son, Alexei, and crept closer and closer to the Tsar's family, gaining the favor of Nicholas and Alexandra. However, this was most likely a sham. Rasputin's self-declared abilities not only sound bogus, but also it was most likely a con. He may have not been graced with healing powers from God, but he was most definitely proficient in hypnosis. There are strong arguments in historical records showing that hypnosis was quite a popular trick in an Orthodox priest arsenal. Though on paper, it does seem like Rasputin was able to curb a lot of Tsarevich Alexei's hemophilia-related ailments, which he genetically inherited from his great-grandmother, Queen Victoria of England. But according to historians, there was trickery afoot. The real reason behind the improvement of Alexei's health appears to be the discontinuation of aspirin being administered to the young prince. Aspirin is an effective blood thinner and thus was doing more harm than benefit to Russia's last Tsar's son. And even though there is no basis behind Rasputin's claim to have mystic powers, he supposedly managed to stop Alexei from profusely bleeding in a particularly bad episode with mere praying in 1908. This was the moment Serena fell under his spell, hook, line, and sinker. From there on, Romanovs began to introduce the greasy-haired gaunt mystic as our friend, and he was summoned not only when Alexei required healing, but also when Nicholas or Alexandra needed some personal advice or consultation. However, despite being their fixer, Rasputin failed to help the Romanovs with their declining popularity. Nicholas II was nowhere near a strong leader as his father Alexander III, neither did he have his gravitas. Alexandra was German and thus was always treated with suspicion in Russia's inner circle, which only got worse after she began parading Rasputin everywhere, along with herself as the royal family's consort. This generous, lascivious reputation bestowed upon an uneducated peasant only raised resentment and tensions were exacerbated. Rasputin, though, acted as the biggest well-wisher of the Romanovs. In truth, he did nothing to help their cause. As his power increased under the protection of the Tsar and Serena, his debauched lifestyle became grander with great impunity. The elites of the Russian royal court began gossiping and conspiring against the mad monk while Rasputin was openly wooing the female nobles and betting them. It is alleged he slept with countless women across Russia, and many of them were wives of nobles of the royal court. Yet, despite everything, his wife, who he married at the age of 19, and the many children he had with her, remained loyal to him. Such was the charm of the scary Rasputin that when his wife was questioned about his extramarital activities, she responded, he has enough for all. The only real benefit Rasputin offered the Romanovs was that he could be their perfect scapegoat. The man who defended his terrible actions by proclaiming himself as Christ in miniature had such a grasp on the monarchs that Tsar Nicholas II willingly chose to neglect complaints about him. 
I know Rasputin too well to believe all the tittle-tattle about him, stated Nicholas. Now, due to his constant presence in the corners around the Tsar and Serena, people would blame him for the weak monarchy's incompetence. Accusation and resentment against Rasputin were at an all-time high around Russia, but the monk did not have a care in the world. In fact, he was so sure of his position and impact in Russia that he would openly boast that Serena Alexandra was one of his conquests while making obscene gestures in public places. Despite being at the epoch of his social status, Rasputin didn't do much to change his peasant look. He didn't even bother to change his manners and behave accordingly in front of the well-mannered and well-behaved elites of Russia despite living with them for years. He kept his clothes simple, hardly bathed despite reeking, and never bothered to pick up a knife, spoon, or fork on the dinner table. But it doesn't just stop there. It is said that he would lick spoons before serving others and often had portions of food in his long, unkempt beard. Yet despite his filthy beard and malodorous appearance, his charisma was beyond 20 on his character sheet, and his followers kept growing even in the wake of the rising numbers of his enemies. There are rumors that he would test his followers' loyalty by dipping his dirt-crusted fingers into jam so women could humble themselves by licking them clean. The prize of accomplishing that? They would get an innuendo-laden nickname from him as a sign of his adoration. Or, if they are really lucky, they would be tasked with a very rare duty, to bathe him. It is pretty much obvious that almost all of his followers were female, and why they were chosen by him. He would call this whole facade of a ceremony, Day of Salvation, where he would purify their souls by spending a day privately with them. Flocks of acolytes would gather outside his house every day, sometimes the crowd surpassing the three-digit mark. A lot of them would bring a flower and hope to take a souvenir back with them as a blessing, even if it would be his dirty nail clipping. He would gladly boast and insult his followers in the same breath. Idiots bring flowers every day. They know I love them. When the First World War broke out, Nicholas II left Alexandra in command of the affairs of the state and personally took charge of the Russian forces in September of 1915. Rasputin was initially vocal against the war, but Nicholas leaving the court opened up new avenues for the Mad Monk. With Alexandra enchanted under his spell, Rasputin effectively became politically the most powerful person in Russia for the time being. Rasputin used these newly acquired powers to make swift changes in the Russian court, to replace his opponents with his choices and help those who wanted to avoid the front lines by extorting a heavy bribe. The claims of sabotage and treason grew louder and louder. Rasputin indeed was the primary accused, but the monarchy was blamed as well. Once more, the situation grew too dire to stop an imminent revolution from happening, and the self-preservative nobility didn't want that to happen. So, they all decided that Rasputin needed to perish. However, it seems even death was scared of Rasputin. It is rumored that he somehow always knew who was plotting against him, and he managed to foil every attempt at his elimination before they could happen. A peasant woman named Chionya Guseva actually managed to skewer him in 1914, but somehow Rasputin survived the near-fatal injury against everybody's expectations. Rasputin's sheer will for survival would again make him almost invincible on the fatal night of December 29, 1916 as well. That fateful night, Prince Felix Yusupov, Grand Duke Dmitry Pavlovich, right-wing politician Vladimir Duriskovich, and their followers attempted to dispose of Grigory Rasputin again and again, only to be shocked to see him try to get up no matter what. The blurry details of that night have made this story an urban legend. It is believed that Rasputin arrived heavily inebriated at the party of Prince Yusupov's house after gulping down a dozen bottles of wine with followers in a bathing house for the entire day. Rasputin was possibly having an affair with Yusupov's wife Irina, so Yusupov had a small cabal of conspirators waiting with him who first offered Rasputin cakes and wines laced with a very potent poison. It is believed that Rasputin consumed enough of that poison to kill five men, but he showed no signs of perishing. Then they dropped the pretense and shot him at point blank. The conspirators celebrated with wine as Rasputin fell and bled, but to their shock, he got up again and ran for his life in the deadly cold winter. The conspirators tried firing at him again, but despite crashing again, the nearly dead man rose once more. So, they chose to beat him, but when that didn't seem adequate, they planted another bullet in his brain. 
Afterward, they wrapped his body in a carpet and threw him in the cold water of the River Neva. He was discovered two days later, washed up ashore. The evidence pointed that he was still alive when he made it to the shore and succumbed there. His death was soon followed by the Russian Revolution and the death of the Tsar and Serena. Democracy replaced the monarchy in the country. It is said that Rasputin knew he would either die at the hands of common people or nobility. He had warned Nicholas if common people caused his death, the Tsar's family would rule Russia for centuries. But if nobility ended him, that would bring the end to the Romanov's reign as it happened. Thanks for watching Nutty History. Please like and subscribe if you would like to watch more entertaining videos like this one.